What's up, everybody? Dan Tortora here with Isaac Elford here on a very special wake up call with Dan Tortora. You know that we bring you pregame and postgame throughout the Syracuse Orange football season. And Isaac's been with me from the beginning this season as he signed on with Dan Tortora Broadcast Media and wake up call with Dan Tortora. So I'm happy Isaac and I have gotten to do some things together over the years. Now we get to do things very purposeful and consistently. And now we get to talk about Syracuse's team getting a victory, the first in four weeks, as I'm here with Isaac Elford in a very special post-game report coming on the heels of Syracuse's road victory over Virginia Tech. Isaac, what's up? Hey, Victory Sundays. Always feels good to be here with you. And, yeah. and, and after a victory, you know, break a 10-game a losing streak. So, hey, it's a good day. I was sitting here going to myself, I'm like, I'm like, what a victory Sunday feel like? <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? I was like, what am I supposed to do today? So, but <laughs> it's it's great to see Syracuse get this victory. Obviously, I'm wearing number 44 here for my uh, very, very close friend that I love and I miss dearly, Mr. Floyd Little. And a uh, shout out to being able to spend some time with Deborah uh, recently, his wife here, and the hug that she gave me. Just sometimes you don't have words for for things, and and that that embrace uh, it made me feel almost otherworldly, you know. That maybe there was a little bit of Floyd in that hug. So uh, definitely appreciate Deborah and her family. Awesome event, awesome time, wonderful to see. I'm wearing number forty four though, and I, and I might as well ask you the question because the fans are talking about it. Should they should they bring back number forty four? I'm glad you asked that question because I've been talking, thinking about that myself. Be honest with you, uh, I think 44 has its purpose for the university and everything it represents and means. I know um, for the great players that wore that number, uh, but I'm a little, I'm a little, and I know how the fans are. They want to see it back too, but I, and actually I kind of felt that way too, but actually watching what Sean Tucker's doing, I'm a little indifferent now. I think, uh, when I think of 34, I think of the great Walter Payton, you know, I mean, it's a running backs number. And I think that yeah. Sean, you know, whatever that number means to him is doing this justice too. And I think it's kind of cool. Hey, won't you bring another number into the mix if you can, you know, I mean, I'm pretty sure he would be honored to weigh 44. Um, but you know, I will leave it to him. Make it, it's his decision. You know, I mean, I think 44 is a great, um, uh, uh, not accomplishment, but an honor to be offered that number. But, hey, give it to the player. I know everybody want to give it to Tuck, but, hey, I mean, I can respect him if he say, hey, I want to keep 34 and make my own name, you know. But, uh, you know, I, and I understand the reasons why. And it is a number. And it's funny you asked me this out the gate because that's what I was thinking about this morning. Yeah, you know, I mean, to me, I have kind of put it on the back, and I haven't thought about it a lot. I thought about it. Uh, a couple of years ago when they said that they unretired it. Well, what I was told of that situation though, is that when they said number 44 was unretired, mm. that there's potentially legal and stuff in the background that the publicity of saying that they unretired it, that maybe they didn't actually do it. It was more of just a PR moment that wasn't maybe carried all the way through so the mm -hmm. whole notion of is it available or is it not available is still up in question right now and I think that for me knowing Jim Brown I mean and listen there's a lot of people in history that wore it there are people that didn't play quarterback that wore it and mm -hmm. or play a running back that wore it and it didn't really get known until Jim Brown and then Jim passed it to Ernie Ernie passed it to Floyd and uh, it ended in, I think, 1999 with Rob Conrad. So, and, and Rob, you know, I've gotten to talk to him about it. Rob's a friend. And uh, one, of the, one of the people on a, on, on a, on a list of, of, of individuals that I wanted to talk to in my, my life, uh, you know, to talk to the last guy that wore 44. And I was a big fan of Rob Conrad when he was with Miami and Dan Marino. And he wore 44 there. To, to look at the history of it, I can appreciate it. And even wearing it now, I feel, I feel something of it. You know, mm -hmm. I, I actually, when I put this on, it doesn't feel like it, it feels different. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, if it feels different for me as a, as, as just a, as a broadcaster, 
then I can only imagine what it feels like for somebody to wear it as a player. Rob Drummond talked to me about this, and I bring this up to your point. Rob could have worn 44. Mm -hmm. And Drummond and I are very close, extremely close friends. And him and I, over the last 10 years that we've been friends talking about this, he said, I could have wore 44. But I chose to wear 36 because I wanted to have my own identity. I wanted to make my own way. I wanted to have my own number. I didn't want to be connected and have that like of somebody else. I wanted to be my own person. And in that same respect, I look at Sean Tucker and what you said, number 34, that that's his number, that 30, that somebody could come to Syracuse 10 years from now and go, I want to wear 34 because the great Sean Tucker wore 34. Mm -hmm. So for me, and I also compare Sean and Rob because Sean to me is a lunch pal kid, blue collar, go to work. Don't care if I have any stars. I'm a kick your butt. Nobody's taking my spot. I'm fearless. I'm fierce. If you think anything, if you think you know who I am, you have no idea. That's Rob Drummond to me. Rob Drummond to me and Sean Tucker, lunch pal, blue collar, don't stop. Take the contact. I'm not going down. It doesn't matter what anybody else says. I know who I am. And if the world is against me, I'm going to show the world what I got. Exactly. It, so I see Sean Tucker in Rob Drummond, Rob Drummond and Sean Tucker. I see that. And, and another parallel to that is that Rob wore 36 and Sean is wearing 34. Now, granted, as far as we know, Sean was never given the opportunity to wear 44. Rob was. And Rob said, no, Michael Owens ended up wearing it within that time period of him and Moose Johnston and, and Rob. So seeing that parallel and seeing how Rob paved his own way and making those comparisons between him and Sean is how they kind of just are quiet and they want to just play the game. Like you've been there in the press conferences. Sean doesn't say a lot. It's, and I think that maybe that'll change over time and he'll become more, you know, talkative, more open, but what I mean by what he does is he's just serious. You know, he just, he just wants to play. He doesn't want to tell you how great he is. He just wants to play. So seeing those parallels and seeing that they both have numbers that aren't 44, I'm totally okay with them not doing it. I'm also more on the side of, if you're going to bring back 44 for them to use it in recruiting instead of post recruiting in Sean's case. Yeah, I, I can see that too. Uh, and those, what you say about Rob and everything, that makes perfectly good sense, you know, because you definitely want to have your own identity. And again, 44 to me is, is, uh, it has a historical factor to the university. And you don't want to, and that's what I kind of think about Shine too, is like, okay, if we give him this number, is it going to be more, not that saying he, he, I mean, he's a competitor. He's not going to, I don't think mentally he's going to worry about, but you know, it's just like, you see 44 back on the field now, it's, it's going to be just too much hype and expectations on him. And I know um, the young man, he's already doing great things. So why add that extra pressure to that? You know, I think it would be cool kind of be like an honorary captain type thing or, you know, something where kind of like the 25 is for Virginia Tech. You don't have to be every game, but maybe I know they got a committee of guys that want to vote on who gets to wear it, but maybe not only just for academics and play on the football field, but what you do in the community, you know, a reason to give a platform to that player for that game, you know, yeah. bring that number out to the fans or whatever it may be, maybe senior day or something like that. You bring the number out or whatever it may be, but you know, I, I can respect both of those, uh, those views. Yeah. You know, and you bring up a good point because I, while you're talking about it, you know, bring the number out for a game ceremoniously to honor somebody I for the work they put in I as soon as you said that I thought Zaire Franklin should have wore it for a game exactly you know and because he had four and so to me Zaire Franklin should have wore 44 uh Sean Tucker I could have wore it on the day that, that Deborah Little and the family came back you know I I look to other switch Eric Dungey could have wore it for the camping world bowl. You know, I, there's, there's a lot of Andre Cisco could have wore it. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think that for me, I think even too, uh, when Andre Schmidt was, was, you know, one point away from passing the all-time leading scorer record that he could have wore it going into that game. Mm -hmm. 
Right. You know, that because he and then in that way, the spirit of 44 is on special teams. It's on offense. It's on defense. Then 44 is everybody. Then anyone at Syracuse could wear it. And then it really then it carries it takes it away from being just a running back number. And it makes it an honorary, you know, if you've done your job at Syracuse and you've made your mark in history, then you will become a part of the legend of 44. If you're a kicker, if you're a punter, if you're uh, if you're a running back, if you're a quarterback, if you're a wide receiver, if you're a defensive lineman, a linebacker, how incredible would it be in recruiting to say, if you do your job, because Dino does it on defense with single digits. Mm-hmm. If you earn a single digit for the season, that means that you're one of the prominent players that's earned his respect on defense, like Marla Wax switched to two from 32. But how cool would it be if number 44 was utilized on offense, defense, or special teams in any given season in a special event situation? Then if you're a kicker, you're thinking, I could wear 44. You're a quarterback going, I could wear 44. You're a linebacker going, there could be a day where I get to wear 44 in a bowl game. So, so now all of a sudden it becomes a recruiting tool for every single position. Yeah, no, I totally agree with that in those cases, especially like you say, in a bowl game, because then that just shows your mark through the whole season. You know, yeah. what we did for the team and how your players feel about you. You know, it could be almost voted, you know, or however the coaching staff want to come up, could come up with that. Either senior day or bowl game, those two would be the perfect times to bring it out and honor somebody for the work they've done in the class, the field and for the season amongst their peers and then with the community. Well, I'm going to tell you this right now. Uh, you know, now that we've said this, I think a couple of years from now, you and I are going to look back on this and smirk because I think that on Sean Tucker's senior day, you know, whatever his moment is, I, I think if they're going to bring it back out, I think they'll bring it out for that. And I want, I want us to keep this tape you know, for when, for when, uh, the school and everybody's taking credit for it. I'm like, no, 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 no. We know where it comes from. <laughs> yeah. We've had moments like this before. And I feel like we'll look at each other and smile and go, um, uh, <laughs> you know, I'm happy we gave you all the idea to honor Sean, but, uh, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I do, I think, I think we'll have a proud Papa moment if, and when that happens, because that, that would make a lot of sense to do that on senior day for Sean. Uh, but you know, I'm not against the number coming back. I really am not. But the only thing that I have with this is if it comes back, it comes back. Right. You can't come back and then they botch it on a guy who doesn't pan out and then it's gone again. They can't do that. Right. So if it's back, it's got to be back. Now, here's the thing. Ernie Davis obviously passed on a long time ago. So when it came down to the number 44 and who gets to make that decision, Floyd Little, Jim Brown. Mm-hmm. Now that Floyd has passed on, I would respectfully give that to his wife and Jim Brown. But Floyd even told me, he goes, this is Jim's deal. Like, you know, right. like I'm gonna leave it to Jim. So Jim Brown, this is what I'm thinking. This is how I look at it. Jim is older. Jim's, Jim's, you know, not getting around as easy as before. Right. Jim Brown is on this planet right now. Ask him what he would like to do. What are his wishes? Almost like his will to the world. Because I would want, while he's living, for him to go on record saying it's done or bring it out in these circumstances or bring it, whatever he wants to say, bring it back. Right. I want to hear from Jim Brown himself because of that trio, not that Rob Conrad and these, uh, Michael Owens, these other players don't matter, but Jim started the, the, the beginning of this. Mm-hmm. Why 44 had such a value historically, not that the other guys that wore it before didn't have value, but Jim kind of holds within him this situation. And because Ernie and Floyd aren't here to speak on this, that maybe him and Deborah Little should sit down and someone from Ernie's family should sit down and they should, as a committee, make a decision while they're still alive. Yeah, no, I totally agree with that. Cause uh, like you said, uh, so we just need to get it settled because even when they had the ceremony, to me, it was a little bit confusing in the beginning. I mean, I get it. You honor all the past people that wore the number, but 
was it just to honor the past players or we were then eventually we came out, okay, we're retiring to number two. So, and I get that um, now, but, you know, like I said, I mean, we do definitely need to come to, or they need to come to a consensus before, you know, you can get the word of the people that mattered, you know, like you say, Jim in an era uh, that he played, you know, uh, he didn't get the notoriety and recognition until later years. And, you know, until maybe until after he became a professional too, yeah. that uh, he deserved on that stage in college, you know, and, you know, yeah, definitely want to get, you know, his uh, p- point of view on this. And, and like you say, let's just make a decision on it and that'll be it. Yeah. You know, to actually just for once and for all, see, uh, you know, where, where everybody stands. And that's the thing is, you know, the, let the people that made it do it. I don't think that this school has, especially football. I can't speak to basketball because that Jim has been good to his, his, his alumni from everything I'm told, but football wise, they have not done justice by their, by their football alumni. Mm -hmm. And if they want to do things right, and this is not an attack on, on the university, this is just a real statement because the players have come on my show of all different decades, like four different decades and, and said this, they should be able to sit in and make the decision. Floyd's family, Ernie's family, Jim Brown, Mm-hmm. And, and then when that ceremony is decided upon, that's when you call back all the living members that wore 44 and you walk the Jersey back out onto the field and together they cut the tape from Jim Brown to Rob Conrad to bring it back. I know I'm giving them plenty of ideas to make a lot of money and I'll be coming from my royalty. But <laughs> if you want to do this the right way, let the three families decide and then let all the living members of 44 come back and ha- and heck, have all the alumni that want to come back and have them all walk onto the field together. Just like when you bring the flag out, have them all come out onto the field together, standing arm in arm as they bring that number back to the world. Mm-hmm. I think the 44 should be there. And I think the Rob Drummonds and the Mo Neals and whoever else wants to be a part of this history should be there because you don't, because it's the more the merrier. Why would Floyd or Ernie turn anybody away? I know Floyd wouldn't, I can't speak for Ernie, but to me, I want a moment of silence. I want a moment of tears and joy. And if you're going to bring it back, I want the players to be the ones to bring it back, especially because they have not been treated or represented the way that they should be. Right. Yeah. And like you say, it's no knock on the university. Um, I just think um, and it took a long time. I mean, even, you know, I'm not from New York or Syracuse. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I, I'm pretty consider myself a, a sports person, you know, following sports. But, you know, I've lived here for 20 years now in Syracuse. And, yeah, you know, in my early years, I mean, I didn't really know Jim Brown was an alumnus of the university or, you know, one of my favorite NFL players, Art Monk went to Syracuse, you know, and I think uh, as the university goes with this, they definitely need to, I would like to see players honored, you know, maybe a little more quicker than they are. Um, I don't say it has to be senior day. I know some universities do it on senior day, which is cool, but, um, you know, I would definitely like to see a lot of those guys that earned that respect and, and, and play for the university and, and left it out on the field, get their recognitions a little sooner because it can tie back into recruiting, like you said. I mean, I mean, a lot of this stuff is great, what they've done. But, you know, to some of the generations, you know, like, hey, that connection is still, it's, it's just not there. I mean, <laughs> we're talking some years, you know, but symbolically it does mean something, you know. It's not, it's nothing to say to poo-poo it and stuff, but it does mean a lot to uh, recognize these guys. You know, John Mackey, not say with 44, but the Mackey Award is named after a tight end that went to Syracuse University. Yeah. You know, so there's a lot of history in the university for those diehard fans that follow the university and know this. But uh, I definitely, you know, like I said, not a knock, but we like to see those type ceremonies and those things happen sooner. And maybe we can, like you say, reconnect to recruiting and, and some people may hey, may want to be their own person and, and create their own way. Yeah, you know what I mean? I look at even Moniel. I mean, Moniel had 2,500-plus yards on the ground. 
in the first two years that he was an H back, a wide receiver, a million different things, but right. he wasn't a traditional running back. And when they finally ran him over a hundred carries per game, he had 155 per game per season. He had 155 in 2018, 869 yards, 170 in 2019, 846 yards. He averaged for his entire career, 5.3 yards a carry. 5-3, 5-3, 5-6, and 5-0, 5.3 for his entire career at Syracuse, over five yards of carry. He was great at catching the ball out of the backfield, had over 100 yards in three or four seasons out of the backfield. So to me, you know, Mo is a guy, 2,560 2, 2, yards to me, and I'm sitting here saying to myself, nobody honored that. Nobody spoke about that. Nobody said anything. 2,500 right. yards in his career, 2,560. And not only that, if they had run him the correct way, his first two seasons, easily 3,000, if not a 3,500 yard back. Now we're saying, is Mo Neal up there with Jim Brown and Ernie Davis? Not be, I mean, statistically, right. statistically. So, you know, Mo Neal to me is one of their, their best running backs of the last 10 years. And how many times did Syracuse say anything about Mo Neal? Right. No, I, I feel that totally and agree, you know, and it's just the way he was used. It, you know, it was just, he was Mr. Do it all when it came to the offense sometimes. And, yeah. but yeah. And why punish him for that? Why punish him for doing it all? You know what I mean? Right. Right. <laughs> but yeah, it does need to be some kind of type of recognition. And that's why I said they slowly they're getting to, to that part, but you know, we need to ceremonially, we need to pr present, you know, those guys, with more uh, more notoriety or uh, some something publicly that shows and proves them, hey, these guys gave four years to the university, and hey, let's give them their flowers while they're still here. Yeah, I agree completely and wholeheartedly. Speaking this conference, speaking with, uh, with uh, Isaac Alford here, myself, Dan Tortora, wake up call special post game for Virginia Tech and Syracuse's game. Syracuse's forty-one to thirty-six win over Virginia Tech on the road against the Hokies. Their first win in four games, and we, coming off of this 44 conversation, as well as honoring the alumni, are jumping into the game here in a very special broadcast of Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora inside of the Travel Cafe Kubal Studios. Shout out, because whenever I go anywhere, I shout out the cities and the towns that I get to broadcast in. Shout out to East Stroudsburg, Pennsylvania. I'm in your hood right now. So uh, what's up to East Stroudsburg, PA? And a shout out to my guy, my dude, Bryce Zaccaro, who has committed from CNS North Stars in Central New York to be a pitcher in the future of East Stroudsburg, and he's going to be coming to the university here. So big shout out to Bryce and a big shout out to East Stroudsburg. Wake Up Call has been able to broadcast live from New York to Florida, all of those states up and down the East Coast. And, you know, we've been in Houston and different parts of Texas. We broadcasted from Toronto. And so to be able to do this broadcast from East Stroudsburg, PA, I always like to shout out the people and show them some love. And I don't know like what East Stroudsburg is known for because I try to try something here or do something here. But I will say that I went to, uh, I think it's called the Stone Bar Inn and they did their food very, I had duck okay. for the first time in forever. So uh, that duck was very, very good. And the uh, stuffed mushrooms were good too. So shout out to the Stone Bar Inn and, uh, and here in uh, the East Stroudsburg area. But yeah, East Stroudsburg, PA, we're broadcasting from you today. And to jump back into the game, Mr. Isaac Elford. Let's see here. Virginia Tech, Syracuse. Uh, thoughts on the fact Syracuse started off the season three and one. Mm -hmm. And then in the last four, went one and three. Literally did the opposite and started three and one in non-conference, one and three in conference play and lost three games in a row by three points apiece. Your thoughts on, on how the season has gone through these first eight? Well, you know, it's amazing uh, that you say that. Uh, uh, and just to throw this on top of it, the team haven't had to buy yet. So even to be at this position of four and four, we know there's a lot of walking wounded out there. These guys are trying to give it their all, make themselves available to be ready for the games each weekend. Um, and out, but you know uh, that those, that four game stretch we just went through, man. Those games were close. I mean, decisions one way or another, or play here or there. You know, who knows what the record could have been? Yeah, it could have been easily 
four and oh or you know whatever it could have been but you know it definitely was some competitive football we played some decent teams in that four game stretch you know and even starting off that uh, stretch with florida state and i was kind of already leery with you know everybody oh yeah it's florida state oh and four you know and i'm like no don't don't just look at the record you know it's still florida state and there's athletes out there but you know what to give credit to the syracuse squad they still wasn't overmatched in that game it came down to the end florida state had to make that play to, to beat them so the all these games that they played they've been in them and and that's a lot to say after coming off of what a one in ten season last year you know for these guys to stick around and play you know and battle and and and, and you just got to find a way to win and maybe yesterday was the first step you know they learned how to win and can close out a game and, and, you know, because going down by two scores late in the fourth quarter, you know, I, I was kind of like, OK, here we go again. But, you know, it's a credit to those players, coaches and, you know, to stick with it and not give up and, and pull out that victory. Yeah. You know, seeing seeing them bounce back, you know what I mean? And there was a ton of moments that, you know, I'm sitting watching a game and I kept saying to myself, if this was a different quarterback, he wouldn't have gotten out of the pocket. Mm -hmm. If this was a different quarterback, he wouldn't have been able to elude that. He wouldn't have been able to turn the corner. He wouldn't have gained positive yards. You know, if this was a different guy and, and, you know, and Garrett Schrader with his feet, listen, I know people like to complain, but here's my issue. And I'm, I'm going to make this very, very clear. Garrett Schrader runs well. So people automatically think he can't pass. Well, mm. well, you know, he's running. So blah. I don't care what he does. If you want a team to win, it shouldn't matter if he gets five yards because he kicked the ball to himself, ran the ball, threw the ball, whatever he did, put the ball, you know, threw it to a stork. The stork dropped it like a baby and he caught it in the end zone. I don't really care what he does. And so I think that for me, and the, and the thing is I've had the luxury and the blessing thanks to Syracuse and God above all, that you and I have seen Garrett Schrader throw. We've mm -hmm. seen him throw outside of season in the games. He puts zip on the ball. He brings it quick. He's got a good sling on it. He can get down the field. I don't think we know. I don't know if Garrett knows to the extent that he can, that he can throw the ball yet. And then under the right tutelage, hopefully he'll get that. Syracuse has changed quarterbacks like quarterback coaches like underwear gets changed. So the hope is that, and people don't look at that either that Eric Dungy had like four quarterback coaches in four years. Like, you know I mean? It was insane. Mm -hmm. So, cause Lester wanted to be his guy all the way through. And so for me to say that Garrett can't throw is a gross misunderstanding of a guy who can run well. Now, what I said should have Garrett Schrader on the field. And this is no offense to Tommy DeVito. This is stats. I would have said this about anybody, Joe Smith. Let's just call it an unnamed person if I showed you these stats. Mm. 2019, arguably Tommy DeVito's best season. 112 carries, 122 yards. Garrett Schrader, 113 carries. One more than DeVito, almost dead even. 587 yards. 5.6 yards a carry, 1.1 yards a carry. That's, to me, all I needed to see. This right. guy can run the ball. On as many opportunities that DeVito had, he's getting almost 600 yards. He's barely getting 100. He's getting halfway to a first down. He's not even getting two yards. So to me, and if some of that is getting sacked, some of that is scurrying and not getting out of it. Some of it's holding on to the ball too long and staying in the pocket. So it, this is not a knock on Tommy DeVito at all. This Tommy could have been anybody. Tommy could have been Jacoby and Morgan. He could have been, you know, Dylan Markowitz, anybody. It's looking at Garrett Schrader saying, you bring in this guy who can run the ball, and oh my gosh, he's over 100 yards a game and shows Sean Tucker. How could this possibly be? Look at the stats. Mm -hmm. Look at the stats. This is who you brought in. He's doing exactly what he is good at doing, but don't misunderstand that he can't throw the ball. Now, did he shock me and probably half the world when he said in the press conference you and I were at a couple games ago, I want to throw every single down? I was like... Really? <laughs> you know, but, <laughs> but the reality is in a game where a quarterback had to command and lead 
in a game where he had to hurry up his offense, in a game where he couldn't afford to make a mistake, Garrett Schrader made pass after pass after pass. Was he perfect? No. Did he do everything right? No. Did he undercut and do this and do that? Sure. But those passes to Courtney Jackson, they don't happen the last two years for Syracuse. Those passes to Queeley, those passes downfield, that pass on the money to Damian Alford, your awesome and incredible nephew, none of that stuff <laughs> happens with a quarterback of these last two years. So I'm going to defend Garrett Schrader in this post game by saying only a good quarterback in coverage that tight can put a ball right here at your chest to catch it over your defender and then be able to get down the field. And not only that, those passes over the middle, he had to be on the money on those. Could have been intercepted, could have been hit, could have been knocked down. He wasn't perfect, but he was the best option this team has had since Dungy. And of these last 10 years, it's been Dungy and him that have been able to make any sort of a move late in the game to keep the team alive. And I think Garrett Schrader needs to be commended for his feet, of course, but for what he did, because he won that game against Virginia Tech with his arm at the end of the game, not with his feet. Yeah, well said. Yeah. And correct me if I'm wrong. I don't have the stats in front of me, but Garrett Schrader is a young quarterback at the college level still. I mean, I know he started at one year at Mississippi State, but again, like I said, correct me if I'm wrong. I don't know if he was hurt that season or he played the whole season or not, but the number of starts he's got under his belt is, is, can't be no more than 15 or 16. He's he's, he's growing, you know, he's learning. And now coaches are starting to learn and trust what he can and can't do. And to, to your point and what you just said is you need a quarterback that can do a little bit of both. Yes. It would have been nice to love to have Tommy sit back there and dissect a defense and, 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 and use his arm strength and make all the throws and stuff like that. But Syracuse is not the Alabama offensive line. You don't have the luxury of sitting back there Again, not a knock on those guys because I think the offensive line needs to be commended so far for this season for what they've done in both pass blocking and run blocking. But to say that, you know, you're going to have that year in and year out at a Syracuse University, no, you probably won't, you know, because the rate that we recruit at, you know, we do what we can with what we get. Yeah. And, you know, but to say all that, you definitely need a quarterback that can improvise, can move around, make plays with his feet. And and like you say, I know he said he want to throw every down. Hey, I want to see Schrader throw every down if he can, because then now you get the wide receivers into the game, and you maybe get the defense to back off the line to give Tuck more room to run the ball or Schrader more room to run the ball. But you got to use the weapons that you get, you know. And hey, uh, he's growing, and 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 it's going to be fun to watch. You know, however many, maybe two more years he's got at the university and see how well he can improve and, and things like that. So he definitely um, brought those guys back yesterday on that last drive to win that game. And the two passes that he thrown for touchdowns, I think I told you the last game against Clemson, how well he stood in that pocket and took the hit when he saw the defender coming. You know, that was just a, a pretty ball he threw, spiral and pin you cut it. And then after Pena caught it, he made the moves. But and then the one yesterday to Alfred, you know, stood in the pocket, saw the hits coming. And that's what you got to do at a, to be a quarterback at this level and the next level. He put his body on the line. Exactly. You know, he put himself in a situation where it wasn't about him. And another quarterback could have gotten spooked, could have gotten scared, could have said, you know, I don't want to take the hit. I don't want to go down. He got drilled trying to complete this pass, knowing that he could have been left exposed. And to do that, that to me is, it's not, that's not just a good passer. That's not just good a quarterback play. That's good leadership. Yes. To say that I might get hit. I might, I might, I might, I might get, I might get knocked on this play, but. I'm going to get this ball downfield, whatever it takes, mm -hmm. you know? And so to say that he's not a good passer, how many passers that can, that can make those throws 16 to 19 want to get drilled? Exactly. You know, I mean, this, you got to understand this guy runs the ball. He knows how to put his body on the line and making something out of nothing is what he did. And I saw him put his head down at one point, And I just said, I was like, keep your head up, young man. 
keep your head up, young man. Don't you give up on yourself, young man. You got, you got another play. And I put right before it happened, I said, you got a minute and eight on the clock, minute four, whatever it was on the clock. I said, you have no reason why you should lose this game. You're down by two. There is no reason why your team should lose this game. And somebody wrote to me and said, Virginia Tech's defense, I have something to say about it. I said, no, good teams don't lose this. Good teams, a minute is, 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 a, is, is seven minutes. Right. A good team with a minute on the field should have no issue getting in field goal range. Uh And what they were able to do was awesome. And I commend them for it. And I thought it was great. And, you know, to go back to Schrader's numbers in 2019, uh, the only season he played before Syracuse, he had uh, 10 games he played in and he, he wasn't the number one option. You know, I mean, he played against Alabama and did not attempt to pass at all. He, He ran the ball once. So, you know, he was not your quarterback quarterback there. You know, we're looking at games where he threw 10 passes, three passes, you know, didn't have to do a ton. He only had one 100 yard rushing game at Mississippi State, only one. And I bring that up because at Syracuse, he has had three now Mm -hmm. and and not just three. He has 178 yards against the top 20 ranked Wake Forest. He hit and 6.1 yards carry and against Virginia Tech, who's a B and a half to play against Notre Dame can tell you that they had a he had 174 yards at Virginia Tech, 7.9 yards per carry and three touchdowns. He has had this season. He has scored a touchdown in six of their eight games on the ground, and he has four of those six games where he scored at least two touchdowns, if not three. Through the air, he has seven touchdowns to three interceptions. So he's not making his, a ton of mistakes there. 12 rushing touchdowns, accounting for 19 touchdowns for the team. And albeit that his completion percentage is not incredible, he led the drive at the end of the game when it mattered most. He uses his legs. And I'm going to put it to you like this. Would you rather have a quarterback that throws 60% and they lose? Or would you ever have a quarterback that throws under 60% but completes the pass he needs at the end of the game gets out of the pocket and can run for almost 200 yards while his running back is running for hundred yards. Sean Tucker and Garrett Schrader together of these last couple games, it's insanity what these guys are doing. It's, it's, it's incredible to see that between the two of them, there's almost 300 yards rushing on the ground. Mm-hmm. So I would say to people that are worried about Garrett Schrader's passing is, would you rather have a quarterback that overall, when you look at it, go, damn, this man accounted for five touchdowns. This man had, what was it all together? He had over 400 yards of offense from himself. He had no interceptions and five touchdowns. Does it matter how the heck you got it? No. So I just think people need to lay off the, the need you know, now that it's not Tommy DeVito, now you got to pick on Garrett Trader. Lay off the need to criticize somebody and look at the fact that he is doing a lot after being a, a not a kind of starter two years ago, not playing last year, and now coming out onto a new team with a different offense where he wasn't the starter at the beginning of the season. So maybe, just maybe, you should give him time because like a fine wine, is he not looking better as we're going through the season? He's not looking worse. Mm-hmm. So no, I, I, I agree. You know, so I mean, my my advice on the Garrett Schrader situation is do a little more of this and a little more of this and have a little more fun. Yeah, because that and... man is a lot better of an option than Syracuse has had in a while, besides Dungy. Right. And then I actually want to say on top of that is like what he's given us now. Maybe not quite yet the passing. And like you said, we're going to work on that. But what he's doing on the ground is almost like what Dungey was giving us in his senior year when they went, you know, to that bowl game. And he's doing this in his first year. Yeah. And he doesn't have the experience game-wise yet. That was my main point is, hey, the guy is just starting to learn what he can do in this offense. And and like you said, he wasn't really the option back at Mississippi State, even though he was a, a four star coming out of high school and all this stuff. He still wasn't the main guy on that team. So he, you know, he got his little, uh, I call it Tyson Hill plays. He came in and did what he could do. 
And but now this is his offense. This is his team. This is his time to learn the system. And, you know, every quarterback is not the same. You know, some quarterbacks in Baber system threw for 4,000, 5,000 yards. You know, this quarterback here may do a both combination of both, throw the ball and run. But I appreciate watching him make plays. That's what it really comes down to. Give me a quarterback that can make plays, you know. Uh, potential and all this other good stuff is good to say, but if you're not making plays in the game, then potential is not winning games, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, I mean, I'm I'm just thrilled to be able to watch the, the guy perform. Like you say, when you look at the stats and all and see what he's accounting for in the offense, and then you add a Sean Tucker on top of that, man, that's a that's a problem for defensive coordinators to figure out, you know. And that's something that you know, as a fan, you can start saying, okay, if we can just start putting, you know, the offensive coordinator can start adding little plays here and there, getting everybody's confidence up. You know, the sky's the limit to what this offense can be in the next what four game stretch or the next season. You know, but. They definitely got an opportunity, and they're always in the games right now. They're, they're not hurting themselves turning the ball over right now, and that's a good trait to have. They, as long as they can keep that up, they're going to continue to be in, in games. Yeah, I mean, to me, it's funny. It's just funny. You know, it's funny to sit here and critique. You know, I'm looking at his total yards. And like mm. Trevor Pena, you know, am I looking at his receiving yards or overall? Kick return, punt return. This man – all purpose is very important to the team. Mm -hmm. His first touchdown was awesome. His first friggin' reception touchdown. First, you know, he runs it, you know, I mean, look at what he did to catch that ball, spin, move, and go. Right. Um, do I care? And, 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 and should a fan care? Oh, our quarterback is running the ball. He had a 53 yard gain. You want a 53 yard pass or a 53 yard run? What does it matter? It's 53 yards. Right. So to me, it's like, just look at what Schrader is doing. Okay. It's like Dungy. Dungy is Dungy. He's a dog. He is a dog. And that man barks and bites. He bites harder than he barks. That's why he was good. And Garrett Schrader is a type of quarterback that if you just shut up and let him play, he's going to be fine. And if you don't shut up, he's still going to be fine. But then you won't be at Kraus, you know, with a heart attack. It's just <laughs> take a break and understand that you are watching Syracuse's most explosive offense in three years. Well, the punter's not that good. Well, the kicker's missing kicks. But your offense is good. Syracuse in the last two years could never have been in this game. There's no way in hell they would have won 41 to 36 because they would have never scored 30 points. Mm -hmm. Syracuse is off. You got to pick and choose. Yeah, I know you want all three phases. I know you want all three phases, but teams that have all three phases, they go to big bowl games, they win championships, they play New Year's Six Bowls. Offense, defense, and special teams. There's not a lot of teams that have all that clicking. It's a hard right. thing to do. It's a very hard thing to do. I said when Drew Brees had the offense in New Orleans, I said if he gets a defense that's just a little bit above average, a little bit above the equator, he'll win a Super Bowl. And what did he do? He won a Super Bowl the year that the Saints had a little bit of defense because he always was talented, but they didn't have the defense. Mm -hmm. Syracuse's team did not have any defense and their secondary was atrocious for like 12 years. Then their defense gets better, but their offense can't score. But their punters are electric and their kickers are on the money. Now you got a defense that's been struggling a little bit, but over the last three years has been good. Now your offense can score the ball, and now your special teams is struggling. Pick your poison. Well, Dan, I don't want any of it. I understand that. <laughs> but do you want a punter that can punt 60 yards or a team that can get down the field and score? Because your punter punting from here to Toledo doesn't matter. You don't get any points for that. But when you got Garrett Schrader and you got Sean Tucker, you got a fighting chance. And that's something Syracuse hasn't had for three years. Yeah, definitely. Um and you know what? It, maybe those teams in the past were strong in those other areas because one unit was lacking and then the other unit was more experienced of being in those situations. How many times have we seen a punter out on the field in the last three or four years? You know, we didn't want to see him, but you had no choice. And he gained as much experience playing the ball. 
Then there's the running backs or the uh, uh, receivers, whoever quarterbacks throwing and scoring on the offense side of the ball. But yeah, definitely you got to pick your poison and 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 be happy and satisfied for what they do. I mean, I just like just watching them make plays and defense is going to go up and down. I mean, it's all, that's the beauty of college football. It's not the pros. You got to recruit. You got to bring in the players, coach them up. And some may be older and ready at a younger, uh, and, you know, and some of them may be just young and just got to get out there and learn as they go. And that's what I really like about college is, you know, no team is going to be the same team year in and year out. You know, some, the players are going to leave. And new players are going to come in, and that's what makes it exciting to watch. And you know, you know, just stick in there as a fan base, and you know, you know, you never know when that time's going to come. And I definitely see better things for this team because they're starting to put the pieces together. They're doing it a slightly different way. I know everybody want to jump on the bandwagon. Oh, Dino said we're going to be orange it's a new fast, and so we're going to do it this way. We're going to pass the ball all over the yard, but. You know, you got to give him credit for making changes, you know. Yeah. You know, DeVito was his guy, but he bought Schrader in. And he made the decision. Um, you know, he, he, you know, he's not throwing the ball all over the yard because he's sticking behind Tucker right now. So you just got to trust the process. And, yeah, those plays are there. Those that the saying they're not, can, they can't go to. I know I would love to see them go to a tight end. We got some tight ends on the roster that I think can do some awesome things. But, you know, and hopefully they're not just holding plays back because I just think that's just the silliest thing in the world. But let the process work itself out. And, you know, hey, maybe in the future we're going to see more plays to a tight end or more plays to the receiver as Schrader gets comfortable in the offense and stuff like that. But definitely, uh, you know, you can see the identity of the team and what you said about Schrader being a dog, and like Dungey was a dog. The team believes that and the team, the teammates follow that. Yeah. You know, you could, you could sense that, you know, a team will rally behind a guy they know that's going to put his body on the line and go out and do the things that he's doing. And they're going to do the same thing and sacrifice to, to not let the, their uh, teammate down. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing, you know, when you know that your quarterback's going to put his body out there, he's going to give it all that he's got. You know, it looked like toward the end of the game, it looked like Schrader was down. It looked like he was frustrated. It looked like he was maybe losing a little bit of confidence. Then he came back and won the game. Mm -hmm. That tells your team, Ben, but don't break. Mm -hmm. You know, and and that's, there's a lot of things that take out of this game. If for nothing, I tell, there are so many things to take out of this win over Virginia Tech to just know the fact that Syracuse would never have scored 41 points in the last two years. Never, mm-hmm. never. In the ACC <laughs> conference play at that, you know. Yeah, just be happy they were in the game. There's no ACC team that has embarrassed Syracuse this year. There's no ACC team that has outright been leaps and bounds better than Syracuse. And I know Clemson is down, but Syracuse lost that game because they missed a field goal. Syracuse lost to Wake Forest because Dino arguably didn't make the best decisions and the Clemson game with Dino, then maybe he would take some of that back. And then you look at the other matchup that Syracuse has in the ACC to start things off against Florida state. And Marlo Wax thought what that, that Jordan Travis was out of bounds. Right. You know what I mean? So it's like, you look at this and you go, this wasn't, like a highlight reel for Florida State and for Clemson for Wake Forest. It was none of that. Syracuse was there and Syracuse coaching wise or a play here or there. That's all it was a botch call by Dino. Why'd you call two timeouts, Dino? Oh, they missed the play on this. Oh, they missed a tackle on it. That's all it is. That's all it is. And I know fans, you might hate me for this. I get this. But when Garrett Schrader was money, when he was 90%, when he was kicking like this, nobody said anything. When he won the Lugroso Award, oh, that's nice. He's a kicker. He should. But he misses a couple, and y'all want to dog him right now. Josh Lambeau made like 84 of 89 field goals for Jacksonville to start. But he missed a bunch this year, missed some extra points, and he's not on the team anymore. 
Does that make him a bad kicker? No. Jason Myers for Jacksonville missed three field goals to beat the Colts on the road. Three. Could have won, could have won, could have won. And he's been the starter in Seattle for years after making all those mistakes. Kickers will bounce back. I believe, I mean, I know that not everybody's going to, but I believe in Andre. I believe in Andre. And you're spoiled. So please stop the hate mail to Andre Schmidt. I don't have a dog in a race. I didn't know Andre growing up as a kid. We're not best friends. We're not related. But I'm going to tell you something. May he, without sin, cast the first stone. Because if you're perfect at your job, show me. Or else Andre and I are going to be standing outside your window with a rock. <laughs> Let the man do his job and keep your mouth shut. That's my thoughts on Andre Schmidt. Because this man, kickers, long snappers, punters, nobody says boo until they make one mistake. They do 100 things right and everybody keeps their mouth shut. Nobody says anything. Y'all go to the bathroom when the punt's going on. But God forbid they miss a kick by this much. 48 yards. 40, and I understand 19 yards, but you know what? I'm going to say something, and I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Dino, because I respect you. You know I do. We have a good relationship. But I got to be real, right? I got to be real. I got to be honest about this. Your kicker missed a 19-yarder, should have never been on the field. It was fourth and one. It was, it was on the one-yard line, run the damn ball in. Your kicker should have never been there. And when your kicker missed it on fourth and one from 48, you should have never had him kick it. So technically, the two plays that people want to flip out at Andre Schmidt about should have never happened. That was a coaching decision. I know he missed it. I know he missed it. But there's no reason on one yard to gain in front of the end zone and right by the end zone that Dino should have even put him in that position. Yeah, you know, kickers are players. Players make mistakes. Holders make mistakes. Uh, you know, and they, they hey, and like you said, he's consistently good. You know, when things are going good, like you said, nobody says a word. But as soon as the offensive lineman make a mistake, kicker, you know, the spotlight is put on them. And, you know, unfairly, you know, hey, they're all human. They're going to make mistakes and hopefully they're learning from them. And, you know, the, it comes in, in, in uh, cycles. You know, hopefully he's just in a funk right now. And, you know, you know those guys are going to go back to the drawing board. And they're going to work on their craft. And, you know, hey, next time their numbers call, you know, hey, he's going to go out. Hey, he did it in the game, man. He came back out. Yeah, he missed a, a, a kick that was less than an extra point. But, hey, for the rest of the game, he came out and did his job. Right. And they overcome adversity, and they won the game. So, but what did you, you know, just say? don't lose faith in them. And what did you just say? He's consistently good, not occasionally great. That's what Dino asked for, right? Right, right. So, yeah, no problems with Andre for me. You know, I mean, yeah, it happens, you know, but there's nothing to lose sleep over. Andre made mistakes. Garrett's made mistakes. And all of you people that are armchair quarterbacks, y'all made mistakes. Y'all married that woman that mama said don't marry, and that woman crazy. <laughs> You know, I think some of these fans, they don't they don't come to the game as being mad at the quarterback. They're not mad at Schrader. They're mad that they married that lady. <laughs> They're mad that they got to go home to her. If they won, because the, the game is the only sense of reality and normalcy and goodness that they have, please, Syracuse, win, because I got to go home to this woman no matter what happens. <laughs> you know? Or they married that dude, right? They married that dude where you're like, he'll change, he different. No, he's not. And he didn't change, and he's not different. And you're watching, you know, true crimes on Netflix, thinking to yourself, this man pretty close. You know what I mean? <laughs> so let's just be real, okay? Andre Schmidt will never be worse than the crazy ex-girlfriends that I dated. So in my book, Andre, them. <laughs> so, <laughs> and that that's talk, that, that, I got you that says a lot. <laughs> that's saying a lot, Andre. You got a lot of work to do to get to that circle of hell. So <laughs> you know, I'd rather have them miss a couple kicks and be normal, but I'm gonna take I'll take Andre any day, you know. That 48 yard boot or somebody chasing me out the house, me thinking I'm gonna be on cops tonight. <laughs> <laughs> 
So, so getting back to the game here and a, a note here on the game, uh, Syracuse in this matchup, uh, putting themselves in a position to uh, get back to 500. Uh, as we look at the rest of the schedule for the Syracuse Orange, they're in a place right now where, you know, none of this uh, by any stretch of the imagination is, is going to be easy and it's not meant to be. And as we look at the last four games, they have to win 50% of them. They have Boston College at home. Boston College, mind you, there's 14 teams in the ACC, seven in the Atlantic, or Syracuse is, and seven in the Coastal. There's only two teams out of 14 that are defeated. They have not won a game in the ACC. One of them is Boston College. Syracuse is right above them with one win in the ACC in the Atlantic. Boston College is 0-3. Uh -huh. And in the Coastal, Duke, still reeling, still suffering last year also. They're 0-3. So Syracuse has to go against a defeated Boston College who is still looking for their first win and the only team in the Atlantic Division without one. What are your thoughts on what Syracuse has left as Boston College comes to town? And then Syracuse will be at Louisville where they never win. Then they have to go at NC State who's ranked in the top 20 right now. And then they have to face off against a top 25 and duly noted and duly deserved Pittsburgh team, two home games, two road games. They need any one or any two of these to become bowl eligible, knowing that Boston College has not won a game in the ACC. Louisville on the road is always an issue. NC State on the road or at home is an issue, but probably harder on the road. And Pittsburgh at home or on the road or on Mars doesn't matter. They always play Syracuse tough. Yeah, uh, no, it's a definitely going to be a, it's a good last four game stretch here um you know you got a, a boston college team that was four no at one time and now they're lost three games in a row all acc games that they've lost so it's almost kind of like last week with virginia tech both team well not syracuse but both teams uh, you played an opponent that's on a losing streak and i'm pretty sure when you back a wounded dog in a corner you know, he's going to come out fighting. So you got to be prepared and ready for him. And, and not only that is now you got a Syracuse team that's been played eight weeks straight. Again, I mentioned this in the beginning that hasn't have a bye yet. They, they got their own issues with their guys going down and trying to stay healthy and, and keep guys upright to be able to perform. So, you know, definitely um, it's an opportunity to play Boston college and you got them at home. Um, you know, you just got to get players, in the training room and getting their bodies right and be ready, prepared. Um, you know, Boston College lost their starting quarterback. So, you know, injuries are part of the game and it can affect how teams go because, you know, beginning of the season, you know, they was, you know, they could have been up there at the top of the Atlantic Division too with what they were doing in the beginning. Um, and then if we can get by this stretch with Boston College and say, pull, we get the chance to take our bye. We get a chance to rest. And yes, we got them to go on the road to Louisville, but having a week, an extra week to prepare, an extra week to get your bodies right for that stretch, hey, that's probably the best time to do it. You know, you got to go up against a Cunningham, a guy that's dynamic with his legs also. He might not throw the ball as like he wants to, but another quarterback that kind of reminds you of Malik Willis with running around and scrambling and using his legs. So the bye will probably come perfect for this Syracuse team before they head down to Louisville. NC State, Got all the talent in the world. Um, and you're on the road down there. You know, you have to go down there and play against, you know, that type of a team by Dave Doran. And, you know, hey, after, you know, we can get our, our momentum going and say, hey, just if, you know, can't always count on it. But if they can get bowl eligible before that game, then the last two games are just gravy. You know, icing on the cake, you know, we can go down to NC State maybe cause a little uh, ruckus in the Atlantic division. And then you have that pit team coming to your home field at the end of the season with what they've done yesterday against the Clemson team. I'm pretty sure, you know, a senior day, all eyes going to be on that game. You know, a traditional rival, you know, with Syracuse pit, you know, you can't ask for more than that. You know, pit got to still live up their side of the bargain, you know, without falling off in November. But, you know, Syracuse can have an opportunity to use it as a measuring stick. Hey, we done came this far in the season. Yeah. 
wherever we may be at this time, hopefully work rise. We're not just dependent on that game. But, hey, it would be nice for a defense to go toe-to-toe with a Kenny Pickett. You know, a guy that came back to play and be in the position he's in now. So, hey, let's go out in the field and see what we can do against this team, you know, and, and, and perform and see how well we are as a program. So, you know, definitely the next four games are going to be interesting and, you know, throwing a little buy in there, you know, who knows what this team can do. Yeah, you know, and I think in a great way to break it all down, Isaac, you know, to me, get bowl eligible and then give Kenny Pickett help. Mm -hmm. That's how I look at it. Don't rely on that Pittsburgh game at all. Give him hell. Because it's the thing. That's how I look at it. You got to win your home game against BC, who hasn't won a game in the ACC. Correct. You got to win your home game against BC, which is a rivalry. It's a Northeast. It's, it's been around for a long time. So you got you to gotta, you gotta win that game. And then you got to win one of the games on the road. Make history. You've never won in Tallahassee, and you almost did. Last second field goal changed it. So Schrader, you ain't never played Louisville wearing Syracuse cross your chest. So you ain't oh and whatever. You zero right. and zero. You got nothing, right? Them fans in the stands mad at their wives screaming, ah, you know, it doesn't matter. <laughs> uh-huh. you know what I mean? I didn't get jalapenos on my chips. I'm pissed. I don't care. He's zero and zero right now. He this and this. Exactly. So that's all it is. If I'm Garrett Schrader, I'm free as a bird. And then I got to play NC State. Okay. Give me the challenge. Again, Schrader, I'm zero and zero against NC State. So there is no, there should be no concern. Okay. What do they say about life? Don't live in your past. Don't Mm -hmm. live in your past with a past boss, past girlfriend, past boyfriend, past place you live. You can't hold the present on the past. You can't have the past sins be in your present. So if I'm Garrett Schrader and I'm this team, that's what I'm thinking. (laughs) I'm not 2019 Syracuse. I'm 2021 Syracuse. And as far as I know it, we got two games to win to get bowl eligible. And no matter how many games we lost last year, that's not getting added to this year's total. So we started this year, nothing to nothing. That's how we're going to continue here. Every game, win the week, one and oh, they're one and oh, they're not one and three in the ACC mindset wise. They're one and oh in the ACC. Now go be two and oh, that's all you got to do game by game, day by day, minute by minute habits positively or negatively are started and becoming true habit within three weeks. So you got, you got three weeks here, try to make a good habit, get three wins. Don't worry about Pittsburgh. Don't worry about any of this stuff. Just play each game the way it is. Don't even worry about being bowl eligible. Just play the game to your strength because the Syracuse team that I've known the last two years would have never, ever had a chance against Virginia tech, especially on the road. Mm-hmm. So, I give them credit. I give Schrader credit. Sean Tucker, 1,000 yards, did it. Boom, done. 1,007 on the first drive. Loving it. All purpose did it last week on the first carry of the game. Got 1,002 on a seven-yard carry. And this on a 28-yard touchdown gets 1,007, does it on the first drive again. He likes to get the records out early in the game so he can play more free. But (laughs) Sean Tucker doing his thing. Schrader doing his thing. Syracuse gets the dub. Getting there, getting there, getting there, getting there. Finally did it. They broke the seal, and now it's time to keep on rocking with it. So hopefully they continue to eat here. I appreciate the work that they put forward, the fight that they had in them. And I'm happy for Dino, and I'm happy for the team, and I look forward to what's to come. So this post-game report gets to be a win. And I'm not even going to talk about them other losses because Syracuse is 1-0, and and now they got a shot to be 1-0 and again. Any final words, Isaac? Yeah, one more shot. Shout out to Sean Tucker for setting the uh, 100 yard rushing record, six straight games for the university. You know, that was a, a compliment the young man did yesterday, also. And like you say, he liked to get those records out and done with. Now he can play free and easy. But uh, you know what? You know, this team, I enjoy watching them so far this year. Like you say, last year doesn't matter. And this is presence, it's the only thing that counts. So, uh, definitely want to see what they got left in the tank for the rest of the season. And you know what? The sky's the limit, and I hope them all the best. Yeah. Also, numbers-wise, through seven games, had more yards on the ground, 948, than anyone in the history of Syracuse. 
including right. Joe Morris, Ernie Davis, Floyd Little, Jim Brown, and Larry Zonka. So he already had a record before he had a record. Mm-hmm. So shout out to that. And shout out to my, my guy, my friend, Jerome Smith, who find, who wanted to see a thousand yard back. He didn't want to be the, the last one almost a decade ago. And now he isn't. So shout out to my man, Rome. The hay is never in the barn as he knows. And uh, appreciate everybody for uh, watching the show today, listening to the show. You can catch wake up call with Dan Tortora every Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. Eastern time on facebook.com backslash wake up call DT facebook.com backslash live now DT youtube.com backslash wake up call DT and on wake up call DT.com as well as on mixlr.com backslash wake up call DT. Once we go live, you can check it out in the archive on TuneIn, Stitcher, Spotify, YouTube, iTunes, Apple podcasts, as well as mix LR iHeart radio by searching wake up call with Dan Tortora or one word, Wake Up Call DT. And a big thanks to our Cafe Kubal studio partner, as well as Carvel DeWitt, Mon Paz Kettle Corn and Popcorn Factory, Honda City of Liverpool, the Wildcat Sports Pub, Millhouse Market, Canine Camp Dog Daycare, Avicoli's Canine Campground Dog Boarding, PB&J's Lunchbox, Chick-fil-A Cicero and Chick-fil-A Clay, Victory Sports Medicine Orthopedics, Pizza Man, Progressive Dental, Mother's Cupboard, and of course, our proud multimedia marketing partnerships with the Lemoyne Dolphins, Fins Up, and the Marywood Pacers, Pacer Pride. So make sure you check out more at lemoynedolphins.com and at marywoodpacers.com as well. For Isaac Alford and myself, Dan Tatora, I bid you a fantastic victory Sunday and so much more. Isaac, I'll talk with you soon, and uh, thank you for all you do. You bet. <laughs>